Dennis, I want to find out about reality. And beauty keeps coming up in our conversations. I talk to mathematicians about their equations, physicists about the simplicity of their laws, and they talk about beauty. I want to talk to a biologist. I'm an old biologist myself, so I'm a little prejudiced. I want to talk about the beauty in the biological world, and can that also help us to discern something about reality? Yeah, well, of course, I'm a biologist too, as you know, and there's lots of beauty in biology, so I'm glad we can talk about this topic. But as you know, also, there's an old saying that beauty is in the, in the eye of the beholder. And I think that's particularly true in biology, you know, that actually what we see as beautiful in biology, often other people can't quite see it in the same way. Mm. Now, I'll just tell you a story about that. I was down uh, speaking at a conference in Barcelona in Spain just a few years ago, and I, I, I drew this short straw. I had to speak at the very last session on the final morning when everyone's leaving for their plane and all that kind of thing. And uh, actually, here's some of the, the data that I was showing in that uh, particular conference, and uh, you can have a look at it. It's just little black lines on a piece of paper, and I, I suspect you probably don't see that as being very beautiful, like most people wouldn't see a lot of beauty in that. But, you know, right after the session at the end, when I give my talk, uh, an old friend from Harvard came up, who's a professor there, and uh, he just came up and said, I'm so glad I didn't catch the only flight, you know, because actually, that was such beautiful data, and I'm so glad I stayed. And I think what he was saying was not just the elegance with which the experiments were done. They were done by a very good uh, Chinese postdoc in the lab uh, called Rui Zhao, who's done a great piece of work there. Um, but because it gave us a tremendous insight into the very early stages of the beginning of cancer in one particular kind of immune cell. And it was that insight, coupled with the fact the experiments were done cleanly and well, that I think gave him that insight. This is something beautiful that tells us something we just didn't know before, even though it was about cancer, actually. So we have uh, beauty in the expression of cancer. Well, in a sense, you know, those of us who are doing cancer research, although it's a horrible disease, which we're obviously trying to defeat, yet it takes us right into the very heart of how cells multiply, what causes them to divide, uh, and why don't they stop? And, and cancer simply is, you know, cells that keep dividing and then don't stop. So as you go into that, it gives you an insight into the molecular complexity of the cell, into the way that cells divide normally and abnormally. And there's something very elegant, very beautiful about that whole system and the way it works. And that's fantastic. C can we talk about the beauty in that experiment? I, I see it may maybe in two parts. One is the design of the experiment, perhaps the clarity of the results. And the other is the beauty that you see in the mechanism that be, that's being described. Are those two, two components? I think they are, actually. I think there are, there's, all, there's a number of components often in biological beauty. But I think an elegant experiment well done with a clear result, especially when it gives you an insight into something that nobody had realized mm -hmm. before. Actually, that, that data I just showed you, we now know, we didn't know at the time, actually, is all about two amino acids in one protein, that protein is the key to the survival of cells that have DNA damage. So cells that become cancerous actually accumulate DNA damage. And there's an oncogene in this case, which prevents those cells from dying. So they keep on accumulating oh. that damage. And it all comes down to the way that that oncogene controls what happens to two amino acids at particular positions position uh, 52 and 66, if I remember <laughs> rightly, at that particular protein at that particular time. So sometimes the molecular detail can actually just be beautiful because it opens up a whole new understanding of the way the cell works, the way that DNA damage normally kills cells, and the way that that's prevented in this particular case by the oncogene which comes along to spoil the party and to keep the cells alive and cause them to proliferate out of control. What are some of the general characteristics of beauty in the biological world? In, in the world of physics and mathematics, they often talk about symmetry, things that, are, that have a, a, uh, a similarity no matter how you look at it. And then sometimes they talk about a broken symmetry, that it's, it's symmetrical, but then a small difference adds to the beauty, like, like great art can be symmetrical, but if it's too symmetrical, it's boring. A little bit of difference creates reaction. What are some of the characteristics in biology? Well, I think protein structures is one example, again, which most people perhaps wouldn't think of as being beautiful. Um, but now if you take all the genome sequences of all the proteins mm. uh, of the world, all the genes that encode proteins, amazingly, two-thirds 
of those structures can be narrowed down to just 1,400 motifs which you find in protein structures. So you find the same motifs being repeated again and again throughout the biological world uh, in these different proteins. So it's almost as if there's some sort of platonic essence going on here <laughs> in the structure of proteins, you oh. know, because they are actually, that you can actually narrow them down to, to this rather elegant, quite small set of protein structures. Now, if you imagine how many possible protein structures you can, you know, you could actually generate in theory, it's an astronomically large number because you've got 20 different amino acids, you can arrange them in all kinds of different sequences. And then, and then they have a geometry, a three-dimensional geometry. Then they have a three-dimensional geometry, which we can now, of course, look at in, in thousands of different proteins. And they look beautiful. They, they do look beautiful, but they look beautiful because they're elegant. These motifs are arranged in certain kinds of ways. And just by looking at that structure, it already tells you a lot about what that protein is doing. What is a uh, motif, for example? A motif could be, for example, an alpha helix. That's a helical structure where the polypeptide structure is going around and around like that, and an alpha helical structure. And lots of proteins have those sort of structures in them. It could be a kind of zigzag structure oh. like that in, in one dimension. So you see a kind of zigzag oh. going down, and, and that's the structure that it takes up. And then you've got disordered loops that connect up these different structures. And they're all twisted around and folded up in, in a very elegant kind of way, actually. When you think that the folding of a protein, you know, it just takes less than a second to fold up once it's synthesized. And it does it, as it were, automatically. It's, it's a self-organizing process that happens. And it has to get exactly the right structure in order for that protein to have a particular function. That's very elegant, very complex, but very beautiful, I think. And there's a lot of work being done on how that happens. How does the folding of those proteins take place so rapidly? Now, this occurs uh, in, in really multi-dimensions. First, it's a linear uh, a structure of the amino acids in some sequence. Yes. And then those mm -hmm. fold in one direction and then another direction. Mm -hmm. how, how many different geometries are required to, to have a functioning protein? Well, actually, it turns out that I mean, the actual functioning protein has to have one of just two or three geometries usually. And if you think about an enzyme, um, when the substrate of an enzyme fits, like a, a lock and a key is the yeah. old analogy, yeah. which still yeah. holds true, that often will change the structure of the protein slightly to bring it into a different, slightly different conformation, mm -hmm. which will then be able to catalyze whatever's going to happen to that particular uh, substrate of the enzyme. So often it's just a very limited number of functional structures that you can have. And they kind of flip between each other depending on what else is going on with that protein. And you can modify the protein by putting little phosphate groups on it and doing different things to it, uh, which will modify its structure to change its properties completely. And that, that's how nature works, actually. That's how it works. It's like a little factory going on, the things going on the protein, coming off the protein, just to shift it around into all these different, uh, different structures. Do you see evidence of symmetry? There is evidence of symmetry in biology. It's not particularly in my field. I suppose I work up the messy end of biology. <laughs> the, I mean, the immune system doesn't look particularly symmetric when you look at it. Um, but there are certainly in protein structures um, and in peptide structures, there are, there are symmetries that, that can emerge that you see. Um, and there are symmetries in the structure of cells and the structure of membranes, of course. Membranes, a famous example, we have this lipid bilayer. Mm. We have a very symmetric kind of structure, um, which has to be symmetric in order to give those particular properties to the cell membrane. Uh, and you see those symmetries as you look down a confocal microscope, as you do X-ray uh, analysis studies, you, you begin to see some of the symmetries that obviously you can't see with, uh, with the naked eye. When you're doing experiments and when you come up with a result that fits into a theory, do you have that, that, uh, that exhilaration of, 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 of uh, beauty creation that, that an artist would or a composer would? Because mathematicians and physicists talk that way in their work. Oh, I think absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it's just an unforgettable experience where you get an insight uh, into something that just makes sense of all the rest of the data. And often what you get in biology is you get bits of data. You know, you get lots of bits of data, and it's like having a jigsaw puzzle where all the bits are strewn all over the ground, and you look at it, and you puzzle over it. You yeah. just can't see how they all fit together. And then one little bit of data, and actually what I just showed you a moment ago, is like that bit of data. It actually helps you then to fit the whole jigsaw together, and it suddenly falls into place. And you have a, you have a theory that actually makes sense of all the rest. 
when that happens, I mean, you're on cloud nine for you know, at least a few days anyway until, <laughs> until, the, so, next until the next problem until the next problem comes up. But uh, but it is a wonderful experience, and it doesn't happen very often to have that kind of sudden eureka moment, you know, when it all comes together. But I think every biologist, like every research uh, scientist, ha has a few of those moments during their life when suddenly everything begins to make sense. And obviously that's where you get your next paper. That's <laughs> where, because not only does it give you great insight into how the pieces fit together in the jigsaw puzzle, but also it gives you your next grant and it gives you another <laughs> postdoc in the lab as well. You know, so it keeps and the And that's beautiful around. too. And that's beautiful as well. That's really important, yes. Yeah, so. You have these eureka moments of beauty with your experiments, rare but wonderful when they occur. And then you reflect on the beauty of the biological world that you, that you find in, in the literature and, and as you understand it. Do, do you ever go further once in a while and, and, and wonder about the beauty of biology reflecting a, a greater insight into the nature of reality? Yeah, you know, I think in a way the whole world is full of signposts of transcendence. There are things we suddenly bump into that point us off to something way beyond the actual context to what we're involved in. <sighs> that happens in personal relationships, it happens in music, it happens in art. I think it happens in biology because at those eureka moments, you suddenly get an insight into a wider text, a wider narrative of the world in which we live. The biological narrative is, is very wonderful. It's part of a greater narrative. The biological narrative is only there because of the laws of physics and chemistry and so forth. It wouldn't be there without that. But as you go into biology, you suddenly, in those moments of insight and, and seeing great beauty in biology, you suddenly think, wow, there's a bigger story here. There's a bigger narrative. Now, for myself, that would be a theistic story because I, ha I happen to be a believer in God, and therefore I would see that whole narrative as fitting together with, within that kind of wider theistic story of, of the universe. So I'm not surprised to find it, um, but it's always wonderful when you find it's there, you know, just as the, as the artist might, might have a, a similar kind of experience of suddenly getting into an insight of something, there's a bigger story going on here than just my painting or appreciation of somebody else's painting. And different people might have different interpretations for what the cause of that is, but there's mm -hmm. such similarity that different people in different environments, many in the sciences, have that same feeling. I think that's true, actually, and it, it, it just reflects the fact we're all looking at one reality but we're all looking from different angles. The way the biologist looks is very different, like in, this, in my lab here, I mean, you know, <laughs> you see all the kit around, you know, it's so different from going to uh, an astronomy lab or, you know, pure maths or whatever it might be. It's, it, it looks very different, but actually we're all looking at the same reality, but we're just using a different lens. We've got different kind of spectacles on, we're looking from a different perspective, and we have to build up all those layers, the biological layer, uh, the layer of physics, the layer of chemistry, in order to get the full picture. So it, it, it is one reality, isn't it, at the end of the day?